Welcome, my excellent AP biologists. Today, um, we're gonna to start talking about the chemistry of organic molecules. Now, why is this gonna be important? Remember what we've already learned. Atoms, molecules, organelles, if you're a eukaryotic cell, cells, right? So in order for us to understand cells, we need to understand the molecules that build them. So we're gonna take what we learned from the introduction in chapter two to chemistry, and we're gonna apply this to complex organic molecules, all right? And if you need the notes, I, if you're watching this on YouTube, I probably put them down below so you can go ahead and grab those notes. Remember, there are two column notes, so you fill in the column on the left with the notes I'm providing and the column on the right, add in some additional pictures or images that will help you, all right? So let me make myself a little bit Smala, and we'll go. Oh, hello, I'm jumping around, and I will present it. Okay, so here we go, chapter three. And first thing I want to talk about is when something's organic, right? I'm not talking about in the grocery store, but organic molecule is anything that contains carbon. It, one exception is CO2 because it's so simple. You might want to add that to your group shared notes up at the top where it says organic molecules, put a little dash there, okay? A chemical compound that contains carbon, okay? And if we look at the structure of um, an atom of carbon, we can understand its behavior, right? We know the atomic mass is 12 and the atomic number is six. So if the mass is 12, that means it's made out of protons and neutrons all together are 12 atomic mass. And six of those are protons, so the other six then are neutrons. And then we know if it has six protons, it's gotta have what? six electrons, right? And if we need to put those electrons away in energy levels, we know we can fit two of those electrons in the first energy level, so we have four left over. Four left over um, in the outermost energy level, those are its valence electrons. Remember from what we learned before, right? If you wanna make an element happy, there's two ways to do that. One, fill up its outermost energy level, right? Or get it to eight, octet roll. So carbon clearly not happy. And this is why carbon will make how many bonds? How many? I hope you said four, right? Because that'll bring its valence electrons up to eight. All right, so you have this in your notes already, number of bonds equals four, and you have two comma four already on there. Okay, so when we look at hydrocarbons, it is exactly like what it sounds like, okay? It is hydrogen and carbon. So here are some examples of some hydrocarbons. You can see methane, propane, ethane, butane. These things look like, I know, fuel to me, right? Because we can burn them. Why? Because there's energy in the bonds between the carbon and the hydrogen. Okay, here are some larger hydrocarbons, plastic, motor oil, diesel, and gasoline. And I gave you the full definition in your notes for hydrocarbons, okay? And carbons, yes, between the carbons, you could have single bonds, but you could also have double bonds or triple bonds. And I've given you several examples here. Okay, and then where we really, what I wanna to get to is functional groups. So these are items that could be um, groups of atoms that could be attached onto those hydrocarbon to give that hydrocarbon a different property. So here's some common ones that you're gonna see. Um, I really wanna point out a couple. One is amine, where you see an NH2 group is attached onto your hydrocarbon. And that we're gonna see in like amino acids and amino acids build proteins. Here is an alcohol that's common that you will see. Another one I want you to see is carboxylic acid, a C double bonded to an oxygen, single bonded to an oxygen, which is also single bonded to another hydrogen, right? So these are things that are gonna come up consistently as we study the four important organic molecules. So on your notes, let me add that in on your notes, go where it says functional groups. It says clusters of specific atoms bonded to the carbon skeleton with characteristic properties, characteristic properties, right? And then here are another way you can, they kind of described each of those properties. So you can look at the group over on the left, you can look at the structure, Okay, now right here, if you see this carboxyl group, C double bond OOH, right? Notice it says it's polar. 
Okay, why is it polar? Remember what we said about oxygen? It's very electronegative. It has a stronger pull on the electrons, right? So that's what's gonna make it polar. It's acidic because it commonly gives up this hydrogen right here. So when you lose that hydrogen, the hydrogen is, hydrogen is gonna be donating its one valence electron to the oxygen. So oftentimes you'll see this as C double bond O, and then C with a single bond, and it'll have a little negative right here. And this is when it's put in water, all right? And you can see an example of this is you see a carboxyl group in fatty acids. Fatty acids will connect to another group called glycerol, and that is one way you make a fat, and a fat is a type of lipid, and we're gonna be learning about that. Here you can see an amino group, and with two hydrogens here. Notice it's also polar. That's because ni nitrogen has a strong pull on those hydrogen's electrons, and so they're held a little bit tighter to them. So as a result of that polar bond, again, this is another substance that will dissolve well in water because it would be hydrophilic as it is polar. Right, so these are just um, several key functional groups. I'm not asking you to memorize these. I just want you to understand its properties and why it behaves the way it does. All right, so take a look at this. So the way these organic molecules arrange themselves depends on their bonds and response to the primary, the primary cellular component is water, right? We're mostly made out of water. And so you're either gonna be hydrophobic or you're gonna be hydrophilic. All right, isomers. So you can read the definition right here. If you looked up their chemical formula, so you looked up their ingredients, right? How many carbons it has, how many hydrogens, how many oxygens it has, it, the ingredients would be exactly the same, but in these two cases, they are arranged differently, and due to their different arrangement, it has different properties, right? Different biological activities. If I was gonna say this in a simplest form, right? You could have a piece of paper, right? And you could either roll that up into a ball and crinkle it, and that's its shape, or you could fold it into a paper airplane. How it's gonna fly and the distance it goes is gonna depend on the way that paper is folded. So this is the same thing here. Depending on the way these elements are arranged is going to affect their biological activities. So on your notes for isomers, molecules of identical formulas, but with different arrangements of their atoms, just like it says on the paper or on your slide, arrangements of their atoms in space. Therefore, they have different biological activities. Therefore, they have different biological activities. Good, okay. So one of the four important organic molecules are carbohydrates. Carbohydrates, when you think of carbohydrates, maybe the first thing that comes to your mind is eating them, right? If you are eating carbs, and that would be for energy. But carbohydrates are really good structural materials too. We see them in things like cell walls, right, of plants or bacteria or exoskeletons. And so um, we're gonna be breaking those um, complex carbohydrates into simple carbohydrates, and then also building them right back up. So here is a complex um, carbohydrate cellulose in plant cell walls, and you can see these repeating units going across here, okay? These repeating units. That's how you build cellulose. Now, we know for us, we don't even have the ability to digest cellulose, plant cell walls, right? We have to use our broad, flat molars in order to break the cell walls down in order to get the nutrients. So how is that built? Monomers are joined together to form polymers. Now, before I talk to you about that, let's go back. Remember when we talked about atoms and stability and how they make bonds. So if you have two monomers and they are um, stable, sharing electrons, they're happy in and of themselves, why would they ever want to join? right? Why would they ever want to join to form a polymer? So what you have to do is you have to take something away from them to make them both, and I'm making this very simple, to make them both unhappy so they get happy together, okay? So there's a removal process. You got to take something away from each of these monomers so that they'll want to join together in order to form a polymer. So here, when we talk about the four important organic molecules and we talk about how they are built, 
Okay, we're gonna study the monomers of each one and then talk about the reaction that joins them. Here's the beautiful part about this. They're all formed in the exact same way, right? It's all about what's called dehydration synthesis or condensation synthesis. So we're gonna see that pattern with monomers forming polymers again and again. So these are our four important organic molecules. And just as a wall can be composed of bricks, each important molecule, each of the four important polymers are made of their own bricks, right? So remember when we talked about emergent properties, right? So, you know, you take this monomer and then you start to build this polymer, it's going to have different properties as a result of that. So let's take a look at some of the bricks we're gonna to use to build these walls. So in its simplest form, all carbohydrates are polysaccharides, poly means many, right? Many sugars. All polysaccharides are ultimately built out of sugars. So whether you're eating a real simple sugar, like a candy bar, or a complex carbohydrate, like um, a baked potato, baked potatoes are still ultimately built out of sugars. So side note, health note on that, if you're somebody who struggles with the amount of sugars in your body, if you're a diabetic, when you eat something like a complex carbohydrate, like bread or potatoes, right, you're ultimately flooding your system with a bunch of sugars as those carbo complex carbohydrates are broken down. Now, fats, um, lipids, lipids is really the bigger umbrella and underneath that bigger umbrella are fats and steroids. Fats are made out of fatty acids and I'll show you those structures as well. Proteins, the, the brick for them are amino acids and nucleic acids are built out of nucleotides. All right, so on your notes, you have macromolecules being large and what you wanna add in there is they're built with monomers, built with monomers. Okay, so now we're going to talk about that building process. Okay, so we have to hook those monomers together to build a polymer. And yes, it could possibly happen if you just allowed it to sit there, maybe they would bump into one another and spontaneously form that bond. Um, but if you would apply some energy is more will facilitate bond making, but specific if you want a specific bond to to form you're going to need an enzyme and so enzymes will facilitate monomers becoming polymers remember we got to take something away in order to get them to join and no i don't know who these people are but they're building a wall like we're going to be building walls okay so let's take a look here you've got a monomer up here and you can see highlighted in blue here is an oh group okay now this oxygen has a single bond right here to whatever this is. It doesn't matter, okay? Here's another monomer, a single bond right here with this hydrogen. Remember, if I want these monomers to join together, I have to take something away from each of them. So this monomer here on your left, I'm gonna take away an OH, okay? Now this single bond right here doesn't have anybody to bond with anymore. He has a vacancy, okay? Over here, you're gonna just take away a hydrogen, and notice when you take away an OH and an H, that forms H2O, that's called water. This is why it's called a dehydration reaction. When you're dehydrated, it's because you've lost what? You've lost water. So collectively, these two monomers, collectively, they have formed one water molecule, the taking away, and this right here is the resulting bond. So if you are here, this and this have now joined right here. So that's called dehydration synthesis because you've removed water. Another name for this is condensation synthesis. Just like if you take a glass, like a cold glass, and then the water vapor in the air hits your cold glass and you form water. So either way you're forming water. So take a look at your notes right there. Dehydration synthesis, building with covalent bonds. Covalent bonds, remember, is sharing. One, yeah, sharing, just una moment. Sorry, I was looking for my pointer there. I found it, took me a while. Okay, so this right here, okay, this single bond here with this oxygen, and over here, this single bond, that's now this bond right here, a covalent bond where they're sharing electrons. Um, you remove one molecule of water collectively from the monomers, and it requires an enzyme, all right? So the next part, take a look at this picture. Find the monomers. Okay, take a moment 
and see now how you have joined monomer one with monomer two right here. And in order to do that, you took an H and an OH away right here, and that forms H2O. How is that gonna happen? Um, it's going to happen with an enzyme, and I'll give you a picture of that in just a minute. Now, let's do the opposite. Let's take a polymer and break it apart. So if we wanna break someone apart, right, then we're going to have an influx of water to form like a wedge between them. Does that make sense? So here, we're gonna take this polymer right here and we're gonna break this bond right here by inserting an OH over here and an H over here. This is called a hydrolysis reaction. Hydro meaning water, lice to break. So you're using water to break them apart. This would also obviously require an enzyme. So take a look at your notes at 2B, hydrolysis. Breaking down, add in a water collectively. It's the opposite of dehydration synthesis and it requires an enzyme, okay? So I think hydrolysis, you're breaking the bond. So take a look at this picture right here. The big purple thing is the enzyme, and we have a whole chapter just to talk about enzymes, but I wanna point one thing to you. Right here is what's called the active site. The active site on an enzyme is where your substrate, whatever you're gonna work on, binds. The shape of that active site is, if it's not the right shape, then the substrate can't bind, okay? So I just wanna put that in your head right now and put a pin in it, we'll talk about that later. This particular enzyme is called sucrase. Now, the cool thing about enzymes is they're always named, usually for the um, substrate they're gonna break down. So sucrase will break down sucrose, okay? Um, lipase will break down lipids, as an example. So you just kind of take off the end of the word and add in ASE, and you'll probably know the enzyme name. So this is sucrase. Here is sucrose. Sucrose is a disaccharide. Di means guesses, like dice, di means two. So it's got two sugars that are joined together. The two sugars are glucose and fructose. Glucose is a very common monosaccharide. Fructose is found in fruit. But this is a disaccharide when they're joined together of sucrose, which is basically table sugar. Okay, so it binds here to the active site, and this enzyme is going to then catalyze this reaction so it breaks it down. Here you can see along the bottom you have to have an influx of water, okay, in order to do that, and then it breaks it down to its monomers, glucose and fructose. So on your notes you have enzymes, molecules, proteins that speed up chemical reactions, that speed up chemical reactions by bringing the reactants together. So molecules, and I put in parentheses, proteins, that speed up chemical reactions by bringing the reactants together. And then a key thing you wanna add on there is that enzymes participate in this reaction, but they remain unchanged. So here you have this enzyme, this is how it is at the beginning, and when you're done, it's right back. So it can be used again and again and again and again and amplify that reaction. Okay, so let me tell you where we're at right now, okay? So where we're at is we learned the basic chemistry of what an organic molecule is. We learned about hydrocarbons, which are just long chains of carbons and hydrogens. We learned about functional groups and how that can change the properties of hydrocarbons. And then we talked about how our complex organic molecules are built out of monomers and how we can join monomers to build polymers and conversely how we can take polymers and break them back down into monomers. monomers. So now the next step for us is to go ahead and discuss the four important organic molecules, specifically the bricks that we use to build them, the monomers that we use to build them, all right? So in this presentation, I'm gonna address the first two polymers. So I'm gonna talk to you about carbohydrates and I'm gonna talk to you about lipids. And then in part two of this video series on chapter three, I will talk to you about specifically proteins and um, nucleic acids, all right? So that's where we're going, take a big deep breath in, and here we go, all right? So we're gonna move on, here we go. Oh, I gotta move myself, sorry. Interesting, it always, thank you.
Sorry about that. I thought it was paused, but I wasn't. So you got a little interlude in there. All right. So when we talk about carbohydrates, probably the first thing we think about is we think about like the starches and breads. And that's true. Okay. Those are all carbohydrates that you're seeing right there. Now, the brick for carbohydrates, um, this is one of the most common, right, is glucose. So when we look at the chemical formula for for glucose, right, we can count the carbons. Now, do you see how when we look at this like ring-like structure, you can see here is oxygen right here. This is carbon number one. Here is carbon two, three, four, five, and the sixth carbon, think of it like a chimney up here. Here is carbon number six. There's a reason for that. I'll come back to it later. Okay, so this is C6, so it has six carbons. And if you counted, uh, it's C6H12, so if you counted up all the hydrogens right here, you would have 12 hydrogens, and then you have six oxygens. Now, if you break any sugar down, it will always be CH2O, okay? And that's where it comes from, its name of carbon, and a, a water is a carbohydrate. It is always CH2O. So for instance, if you had a five carbon sugar, if you had a five carbon sugar, let's make the formula CH2O, C5H10O5. So you could always find from that empirical formula, you could always determine how many carbons, how many hydrogens, and how many oxygens. Now you can write this or you can make it a little bit simpler. Look as we look from left to right, different ways to represent it. Here in figure A was just like what we just looked at. Here in B, you notice they've taken something out. They're not writing it in the picture anymore. What's missing? Can you tell me? Hopefully you said the carbons, okay? So just assume where you, every time you have this, these points right here, that is where you have a carbon. Okay, and then if you look at picture C over here, you can see they have removed the carbons and the hydrogens, and the only oxygen you can see is right here. So whenever you see a picture like this over here to the right, that's going to represent glucose, okay? Because sometimes they will ask you about that on an exam. What uh, monomer would this represent? And you would be able to recognize that that is glucose. Okay, so this right here, do not be surprised if you see that, be able to recognize as glucose. In fact, if you're gonna make a little summary chart, I would draw that next to the word glucose so I could always remember that. All right, so let's take a look. You've already learned this. Here you have dehydration synthesis. So here's one monomer of glucose. Here's another monomer of glucose. And we need to create a need in each of them so that they bond together. So we're gonna take an OH from right here and an H from the second glucose, and that is gonna form the water that you see right here. Then this carbon that you see right here, that it was bound to that oxygen, it's gonna bind directly to this oxygen in the middle. Okay, so it's like they're holding hands right there. When you hook glucose to a glucose, okay, that disaccharide is called maltose. So take a look at your notes. You have 1.2 carbohydrates. Monosaccharides like glucose are for quick energy, okay? And it says most contain six carbons, okay? You have glucose, you have galactose, and you have fructose. Those are your simple monosaccharides that I want you to be familiar with. When you go into your disaccharides for quick energy, okay, if you go down to the second one in your notes, you can see maltose is formed during starch digestion and it's a glucose plus a glucose. Okay, so two glucoses put together. All right, so here is sucrose. This is table sugar. We already learned about that. That is a glucose plus a fructose. That's what, like if people add that to their coffee. Okay, now here are your three common um, disaccharides. Okay, so all of them have in common that they all contain glucose in them. So it's either glucose plus fructose or it's um, glucose plus galactose. Now, so this lactose, this is milk sugar. 
And so its components is glucose plus galactose. Now, some people ask me right then, like if you're lactose intolerant, what does that mean? Okay, so you could be lactose intolerant for two reasons. I'm sure there's more, but generally speaking is you could be allergic to lactose. And so when that is in your system, that triggers your immune response. Another reason why you could have trouble with dairy and lactose is that you don't have an enzyme to digest it. And so that makes you upset as well, it gives you indigestion, etc. Okay, and maltose, we already learned, is glucose plus glucose. So just finish up your notes on there on disaccharides. Um, milk sugar is glucose plus galactose. You already have maltose and sucrose. Table sugar is glucose plus fructose. Okay, so those are your disaccharides. Now, polysaccharides, polysaccharides have something in common, all of them. They are not soluble in water, so they do not dissolve well in water, and they are such large molecules that they cannot pass through a cell membrane. Simple sugars can, okay? We'll talk about that and how they get across and how they get assistance in that, but polysaccharides are so large, there's not a way for them to pass through those cell membranes. There's two categories of polysaccharides. Okay, all about energy storage in a polysaccharide or you're building with it. So it's either energy, okay, or you're gonna build some cellular structure with it. So let's start with starch. Starch is how plants would store sugars. That's one way they can store sugars. You can see these repeating units right here again and again and again and again. So on your notes, when you go to polysaccharides, large, they are not soluble in water, and they are too large to pass through a cell membrane. So they can be used for energy storage. Starch is found in plants. So when, uh, plants are gonna be doing what process in order to make sugars? What's the name of that process? Did you say photosynthesis? Yes, okay. When they make all of their sugars, they can store those excess sugars as a polymer, and that polymer is starch. Now, in our bodies, we will store sugars as glycogen. So when you eat food that is built out of sugars and you digest it into the simple sugars, you will reconstruct it as a storage form of glycogen and you will put that in your liver. And if your liver is full of glycogen, then you're gonna convert those excess sugar molecules into fat, another important organic molecule. All right, so for glycogen, you wanna put found in animals. Okay, so those are polymers for energy. Now, structurally, plants can also use sugar to build their cell walls, um, and that would be cellulose. So structural molecules are indigestible by humans. Cellulose is built, um, builds plant cell walls, and then I want you to put this in caps. It is the most abundant molecule on earth okay right here is cellulose most abundant molecule on earth all right and then like i said we cannot we don't have the in, we don't have cellulase in order to digest cellulose so in order to get the nutrients inside of those cells we have to use our teeth to break those cell walls open okay a, another structural component is chitin and chitin forms the exoskeletons of, you can see right here, and of, a, of an arthropod, let's say, and then fungal cell walls. Fungus, right? Fungus is not a plant, okay? Fungal cell walls are built out of chitin, and I believe you already have that on your notes, okay? And then continuing on, um, this, if, this might be a really good way to use a piece of paper now in our distance learning is use a piece of paper and make this chart. And so you would name the molecules here, right? You would do a simple monomer with structural diagram and then polymers and its functions. So you can absolutely print out mine. I have completed all of these, but the real benefit would be if you could remember how to do this on your own. So here, if I was going to do this, I would put carbohydrates, then I would show the monomers are sugars. The, the monomers that we need to know are glucose, fructose, and galactose. Notice I did a real simple diagram so I could recognize it. And then I gave you what maltose, sucrose, and lactose. Notice G plus G would be like glucose and glucose, 
glucose and fructose, lactose is glucose and galactose. Over here on the right, I listed four polymers. Notice starch and glycogen, plant stores energy, glycogen is animals storing energy, cellulose is plant cell walls, and chitin is fungal cell walls. So I highly recommend that you make your own chart and your own summary table. Okay, now we're gonna move on to our second and for today, final um, important um, organic molecule, and those are lipids. There are two categories of lipids, fats and steroids, and the way they are built is different. So if we look here, there here lists other besides fats and steroids. You can also see oils and phospholipids and waxes, and I will address those as well. Okay, so but the two big I want you to know right now are fats and steroids. Modification of a fat is a phospholipid, and that's super important in cell membranes. All right, so the basic lipid structure for fats is one glycerol molecule. This is glycerol over here. Can you count how many carbons are in glycerol? Did you say three? Yeah, there's a carbon, carbon, carbon. You can see right here an OH group. That would be a functional group like alcohol, okay? And then here you can see that you have three fatty acid chains. These blue rectangles right here are not drawn to scale. You would typically have 16 to 18 carbons here in a long hydrocarbon chain that would stretch across this whole page. They're just making it shorter so it fits here. Okay, so what you're gonna do is you're gonna take this fatty acid chain and with its carboxyl functional group right here and you're gonna attach it right here. Notice you can take that OH and that H and form water, do it again, do it again. So you end up forming a total of three water molecules when you make one fat. So you have this carboxyl group and then you would have long fatty acid chains over here. So if you look at your notes where it says triglycerides, tri, because you have three fatty acid chains, um, I told you glycerol is three carbons. The fatty acid chain is 16 to 18 carbons in a chain. 16 to 18 carbons in your in a chain. And in your group shared notes, I put pictures in there already for you. So you would have those, but feel free to add in more. Okay, now when you've heard of saturated and unsaturated fats, let me explain them what that means. Look at the saturated fats here. Notice all the carbons have single bonds and they are saturated with hydrogens. Okay, that's where that comes from. They are saturated with, with hydrogens. So they have no double bonds, right? In the fatty acid chain, there's no double bonds. I know that there's a double bond right here, but in the fatty acid chain, there are no double bonds. This is typically how you get fats, how fats are formed in animals. And they tend to be a solid at room temperature because they stack right on top of each other, okay? So that is a saturated fat. An unsaturated fat, look at the difference, compare those two. Okay, you can see this unsaturated fat has a double bond right here, so it doesn't need a hydrogen here or here. So that's why it's unsaturated, because of the double bonds. These are typically found in plants, the way they generate fats, and they are liquid at room temperatures because they have a little kink in their chain, they don't stack up well, and so they form a liquid. Now, um, the one, when you look at um, plants, we think about oils, right? Like oil, Wesson oil, canola oil, right? Those are used for cooking, those are liquids. But saturated fats from animals like butter at room temperature, like at 70 degrees or whatever, that's gonna be a solid. So on your notes, look at where your notes are. Saturated, there are no double bonds, creates a straight chain solid at room temperature temperatures and usually from animals then you just need to finish the unsaturated one it has double bonds creates chains with kinks it has double bonds it creates chains with kinks it's a liquid at room temperatures and it's usually from plants all right and i think i have another let's see here we go here we go. Here's another picture. So you can see this unsaturated with all their kinks. It makes it then very fluid, whereas saturated fats, they can stack up and it becomes a solid at room temperature. All right, now, 
The other thing I just want to address, okay, is you know fats, like fats and water, don't mix, right? Because um, fats are hydrophobic. Now, the way you can get fats in solution, like uh, let's say, you know, ranch dressing has fat in it, right? The way it gets in solution and doesn't separate is you have little emulsifiers to change the properties of that fat. So you add on some polar groups and by having a polar end on your fat, it allows it to dissolve into your ranch dressing. Now, something much more important than your ranch dressing is the plasma of your blood. And you have fats that are dissolved into your blood, but that's because they have polar ends on them that allow it to move through your capillaries and not separate out like Italian dressing. Also, we use emulsifiers to clean fats like uh, Dawn dishwashing soap, great on, I don't make any money from Dawn, I'm just, that's what I use. So it's great at cleaning and breaking down the oils because it has emulsifiers. So your liver, has bile in it and bile is what helps break down your fats and you store bile in your gallbladder that's why people who have had their gallbladder removed have a very difficult time um, eating fats because they don't have um, a substance to break down those fats so it's more easily digested and absorbed it's just a little side note. Okay, a phospholipid. Phospholipids are huge when we talk about homeostasis and cell membranes. Let's find the fat in the phospholipid. Here is your glycerol molecule right here with your three carbons. Here is one long fatty acid chain. Here's the second fatty acid chain. Notice it's got a kink in it, so it's like it's kicking its leg out. But this right here is a phosphate group. It's a phosphorus surrounded by oxygens. You know how oxygen is. It's very electronegative. So these bonds that you make are going to be polar bonds. That's why this is called a polar head. This would be hydrophilic. And these long fatty acid chains are hydrophobic. Okay, so this is what you call being amphipathic, which means it has two different properties on either end. So let's go to your phospholipids. Okay, the third fatty acid chain, you don't have the third one because it's replaced with this phosphate group. Third fatty acid chain um, is replaced with charged phosphate group, which makes it hydrophilic at that end, and it's the main component of cell membranes. Yay, okay, getting close. All right, second category, you have fats and you have steroids. These are our two main ones here and modifications of these fats we've just talked about as a phospholipid. Steroids are built differently. Steroids are built out of four rings of carbon put together. This is your typical steroid. Now, and these are two steroids you'd probably be familiar with, testosterone and estrogen, right? So take a look and compare them and what's the difference that you see? Notice they both have OH, CH3, but testosterone has this CH3 here and a double bonded oxygen. You don't have that in estrogen and you have an OH right here. Okay, these extra blue lines represent double bonds. So steroids are made of, this is for your notes, four fused rings of carbon four fused rings of carbon. And your building block for that is going to be cholesterol. So cholesterol is your starting point in order to build both testosterone and estrogen, which obviously cause huge differences right here. Okay, so that's why I have that down and I gave you some points there, yay. I mean, some pictures there, all right. Um, when we talk about atherosclerosis, which is when you have buildup of fatty material right within your um, blood vessels, that would be a bad thing, right? Because you narrow that diameter. Um, and so that would be an unhealthy fatty deposit within your um, blood vessels. Now, keep in mind, a lot of people say, well, if you eat fat like butter, then you're going to get that, okay? I want you to see the bigger picture. Chances are you're eating excessive carbohydrates and because you're eating excessive carbohydrates and you have all the glycogen you need in the liver, what are you gonna do with that excess glucose that you have put into your body? You're gonna store it as what? Fat and that's gonna contribute to these fatty deposits. All right, um, last but not least are waxes. 
And you can think of wax like a honeycomb, right? Built out of wax. But the shiny surfaces of leaves are also wax. And they have one long chain alcohol with one long chain fatty acid. So here's your fatty acid chain, just like we use to build um, fats. So here's your C double bond O and you would have an OH. And then here you have a long chain alcohol. And when you join those together, that will form a wax. So plants, it's used as um, a protective covering and slowing water loss. And we'll talk about that when we talk about plant structures. And then animals, you can see here, maintain skin fur, trap dust and dirt, and form honeycombs. Those are just some examples. And earwax. So on your notes for waxes, long chain alcohol plus a long chain fatty acid, um, waxes have a high melting point. They waterproof, high melting point, waterproof and resist degradation. High melting point, waterproof and resist degradation. In plants, you just need to add in protective covering and slow water loss. And then I gave you everything there for animals. So I know that was a lot and this was a super long video, okay? But keep in mind the big picture, right? The second part of the video, we fo focused on our two, um, two of the important organic molecules, carbohydrates and how they're built and their uses, both monomers and polymers. Okay, then we talked about our second important organic molecule, lipids. We talked about fats and modification of fats, like a, a phospholipid to build cell membranes. Okay, and then we talked about steroids, which are gonna be really important, for instance, when we talk about um, hormones. So I hope that was helpful. I hope you learned a lot and you did a great job. And um, we will, we will, sorry, we will call that Oh, sorry, one more thing. If you're filling out that chart, I wanted to show you how I would fill out that summary chart with lipids. Notice I said fats are fatty acid chains. You could have saturated or unsaturated fatty acid chains with glycerol. This is a simple diagram. This would represent the glycerol and these are the long fatty acid chains. Here are steroids made out of carbon rings. Notice I put four of them together and then I described the polymers. So I wanna make sure you had that as well. Okay, that's it.